Well, welcome to Investor in the Family Radio, a podcast about learning to invest. My name is Brian Bain, and I'm your host, and I am excited to be back with you. I missed the podcast last week, as many of you diehard faithful noticed, and I appreciate your concern all as well. Um, basically, what happened was I am, I've been spending the vast majority of my Investor in the Family energies over the last few months on a new project called the DIY Investing Summit. That's the DIY Investing Summit, and it is an official project in partnership with Seeking Alpha, which I'm very, very excited about. And basically what's going on is I've been creating like a super podcast resource, essentially. It's 25 interviews, or interviews with 25 of the top investors on Seeking Alpha. So if you're wondering, well, who are the top investors on Seeking Alpha? Well, at least in my opinion, Chris Muth, Brett Jensen, Rita Morwa, uh, Brad Thomas, Eric Parnell, Ian Bezik, Richard Berger, Doug Eberhardt. Ralph Baker, Lawrence Fuller, Double, Double Dividend Stocks, Mark Byrne, Mark Hibben, Dividend House, um, Jay Mintzmeyer, William Coldus, Damon Vrial, Richard Lejeune, Avi Gilbert, Shailesh Kumar, Chuck Carnavale, Adam Aloisi, and more, and more. So there's uh, 25 in total. And basically what I'm doing is I'm sitting down with each one of these investors and I'm asking them really any question. I have full reign to ask them all the questions I want to ask. So I've taken all my time doing interviews here at Investor in the Family Radio, and then all my time as a DIY investor, I thought, what what would I want to know if I could sit down for 45 minutes, an hour with each one of these investors and just pepper them with questions to try to suck as much investing wisdom um, and insights and advice out of them as I can? What would I ask them? So I came up with a, a list of questions, and I just... Um, I say went to town with these guys, and it was fantastic. And um, I've completed almost every one of the interviews. I had 14 last week alone, which is the reason I didn't produce this podcast. And I was in this crunch of like I knew as the week was going on, I realized I'm not going to have time to put a podcast out. And I thought, well, should I put record a quick notice to say, hey, no podcast this week? But that seemed kind of weird too. So maybe I should have done that, but I didn't. But um, you are on my mind. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to, um, today we're, we're going to get into Barron's Up and Down Wall Street column with by Randall Forsyth. We're going to talk through that column a little bit. And I, um, uh, I might get into some of the content from the summit as well, just kind of as some previews. But I've actually got another idea of what I might do. I'm thinking about taking some snippets from each one of those interviews and kind of peppering them out through this podcast over the next few weeks. So you can kind of look, get a little bit of a glimpse of um, highlights from some of these interviews, and you can decide whether or not it's something you want to engage with more. I do encourage all of you, if you in any way enjoy Investing in the Family Radio, and if you're listening right now, obviously you do, and I know that I look at the stats, I know there's a bunch of you listening, then you really can't miss this summit. It's free. Go to DIYinvestingsummit.com. That's DIY as in do it yourself. DIYinvestingsummit.com. There'll be links in the show notes page. Go there right now and just sign up. It's free. And there's a lot of ton of bonuses. If you want to, there's an upgrade package if you want it, full of like over four thousand dollars worth of bonuses, all kinds of amazing stuff. Honestly, it's a such a, an obvious decision to register for free, and in my opinion, an incredibly incredibly obvious decision to purchase the um, upgrade package as well. But that's completely up to you. But if you listen to this podcast, it's ridiculous for you not to go and register for the summit as well because you're going to have a pool of some of the absolute best interviews that I've probably ever done all in one spot for free through the DIY Investing Summit. So go to DIYinvestingSummit.com and get signed up, and um, I'll have more on that later on. Right now, let's jump into what's going on this week in the investing world. You know, if you've been reading any kind of news or updates, and which maybe you do, I'm sure some of you are, but maybe some of you just rely on this podcast, which is awesome. But one of the big things out there is, will the Dow Jones Industrial Average reach the 20,000 mark? And so people are talking about, you know, is that going to happen? We're, it's getting really close. And But the reality is, it's really a meaningless number. It means nothing, but psychologically, it means something to us. We talk about it a lot. But what Randall, Randall Forsyth, the author of the article, gets into is, more important numbers are what's going on with currency, specifically with the Chinese currency, the yuan, approaching seven yuan to the dollar. <clears throat> Basically, what we have is the yuan, the yuan, the Chinese currency. I'm going to start calling it the Chinese currency because me saying yuan, um, I always feel like I've got to be saying that wrong, but maybe I'm not. Um, and I've actually spent time in China, so you'd think I'd have that straight. So sorry about that. Anyway. So that's kind of the big thing going on is with the Chinese currency versus the the U.S. dollar. And um, and so really wondering, um, 
if the exchange rate between the the yuan to the dollar does get to seven to one, um, like how how might that happen? Because it's really more important than when or if it actually happens. So we mentioned in a previous podcast the fact that the the Chinese currency has been declining; it's been weakening significantly, and actually, despite claims. Um, by President-elect Donald Trump that China is a currency manipulator. I'm not going to defend the, China, the Chinese government one way or the other. But according to the article, he's for months has been saying, uh, you know, even though Trump is claiming that they are a currency manipulator by trying to weaken their currency to help improve their exports. In reality, they're actually trying to strengthen their currency because they're trying to slow the decline of the currency because the cur- value of the Chinese currency is declining, not because they want it to, but because people, a capital flight, people, Chinese citizens are trying to get money out of China because they're concerned about economic stability and other things. And that's causing a weakening of their currency. So what China has been doing, as we'll get to later on in the articles, they've basically been selling their foreign currency reserves, trying to prop up their currency value. And I'll be honest, the, the, how those dynamics work, it can get kind of complicated if you're not very familiar with currencies. And even I have to kind of stop and think through it a little bit. Um, I won't spend a ton of time diving into that, but basically they're trying to prop up their currency is what you need to know. They're trying to help prevent their currency from getting even weaker than it already is. And so um, basically one of the problems that's being faced is like how these two, the two biggest economies in the world, the U.S. and China, are going to face off with the new Trump administration, which is, you know, he's going to take office on the 20th, which in today's the 12th. Um, and so what's going to happen there? And no one really knows. And so that's kind of in the mix. Something else in the mix is the fact that the Mexican peso, <clears throat> excuse me, has been under a lot of pressure because of Trump's uh, desires to um, prevent U.S. companies from exporting jobs, even trying to get them to bring jobs back to the States. And a lot of those jobs will be coming from China, which puts a lot of pressure on weakening the Chinese economy and therefore weakening their currency and their, the buying power of the, of the Mexican peso. And recently with Ford, the decision that Ford made to not build a $1.6 billion plant in Mexico, that led to a um, – that put a lot of pressure on the Mexican peso – and according to Trump, he says Ford not moving their plant to or building their plant in Mexico is just the beginning. And so Mexico's central bank uh, made the rare move to intervene directly in the currency market, selling dollars to bolster the peso, which had fallen to a record low. So the peso had fallen to record lows. And again, like we mentioned, the Chinese current the Chinese government was selling foreign reserves to prop up and strengthen the the Chinese currency, the yuan. We see here the Mexican central bank selling dollars to bolster the peso. So you see the exact same dynamic. So by selling foreign currencies, um, that essentially helps to strengthen their own. So that's the best way to think about how those dynamics work um, without getting into too much more depth there. And there's also Trump talks about um, uh, imposing so-called border tax on border ta- a border tax on imports or tariffs. But really, currencies are the nexus of trade and the quickest means to try to influence trade flows. And so, you know, he's talked about threatening to declare a current China, China a currency manipulator. But the thing is, this poses just lots of risks and lots of concerns. And one risk is that this will escalate into a currency war, where basically we have the U.S. and China and then potentially other countries all fighting to weaken their own currencies faster than someone else. And so this is where you get into... Um, you know, extreme inflation or hyperinflation concerns, at least, um, potentially. And this is where you get into a lot of people, The whether you want to refer to them as gold bugs or not, people who are very, um, uh, very set on gold as a, um, or, or so put it, let me put it this way, they're very, um, they're expecting the worst when it comes to um, fiat currencies, basically government created currencies like the dollar or the peso or any, any other currency out there for that matter. And the idea is that, you know, eventually there'll be a currency war, um, like described, and everyone's going to fight to debase their currencies. I've even heard the phrase, the race to debase. And in that, in that environment is when gold and silver would shine, like they would, as a store of value, skyrocket in value compared to these fiat currencies, which are um, all racing their way to zero, essentially. So that's kind of the argument there. And so what's being put forth in this article is that, you know, if this 
idea of China being a currency manipulator, at least in Trump's eyes, and he pushes that idea and labels them as that, it could escalate into a currency war, which is that very, I'd say, um, destructive scenario I just described. And as with any war, um, a currency war like this, a currency war like this should be avoided at all costs, according to Randall Forsyth, the author. But again, as he, as he mentions, as the past year suggests, never say never. Um, but again, really, it, in actuality, it looks like Beijing is trying to boost their currency. Um, and let's see, he talks about, and they're making, because ultimately what Shanghai, what Beijing wants to do is make Shanghai the global financial capital of the next century. So now you think of New York as the global financial capital of the world, and I think previous to that it would have been London. And so what Beijing really wants is for that to be Shanghai in the next century. And so if they could do anything to supplant the dollar, that would be really bad news for the U.S. and would help boost um, their uh, ability to prop prop up the yuan in international trade, um, which could help um, reinforce the idea of Shanghai or Shanghai actually becoming the financial capital of the next century, which is crazy for us to think about, but I'm sure 100, 200 years ago, my math, my dates are probably completely wrong on that. It would, I'm sure to um, citizens of the, of the UK, of Britain, it would have been crazy to think that London would not be the financial capital of the world, but they lost that. New York got it. So if New York, if that happened in the past, it can totally happen again. It sounds crazy to us, but it, it, it can happen. I'm not saying it's going to, but it can. And so a, a big thing here is U.S.-Asia relations, but specifically U.S.-China relations. And um, and it's really, it's really becoming the main source of risk to growth around the world is the U.S.-China relationship. So how will China use its new economic, diplomatic, and military power, um, and how will the U.S. respond? Because China has been growing economically, militarily, diplomatically around the world, and they've been, as the U.S. really has pulled back in recent years, especially under the Obama administration, it's created a significant vacuum in many parts of the world. And like I always like to say, whatever there's a vacuum, Whenever there's a vacuum, something races to fill that vacuum, and we've seen a lot of things try to fill that vacuum from um, different terrorist groups to Iran to Russia and China. As America's pulled back globally, you've seen Russia step up, you've seen Iran step up, you've seen China step up, as well as different terrorist groups. And so you, it's in that sense, China is becoming stronger economically, diplomatic, di- diplomatically, and militarily. So the question is, how is the U.S. going to respond to all of that? And uh, the major risk now is global supply chains, you know, in terms of um, before oil price shocks were a huge factor in the global economy. It still is a big deal, but global supply chains have almost supplanted that as a higher risk, and obviously that is a big deal. That that he puts more emphasis on the U.S.-China relationship. Um, so lots of complexities regarding the currencies there. And, um, you know, it's more, China is currently fighting to prevent currency weakness, as I mentioned. And so basically, and to reinforce this, China's reserves have fallen by about $1 trillion to just over $3 trillion as of November. So you've had basically a 25% decline in foreign, foreign currency reserves as China has been trying to sell those reserves to strengthen their own currency, just like we saw the Mexican Central Bank was selling dollars to try to strengthen the peso. Um, and so, again, that which is very, does not support the idea of China trying to be a currency manipulator, at least on face value. So who knows there? And apparently there's some academics in China who's, who are suggesting the country should respond to being declared a currency manipulator by letting the currency float, which would make it trigger even more weakness. But the reality is, um, the last thing Beijing would want is a floating currency, a floating yuan, because that creates even more instability. And it hurt them much more than anyone else, and to be greeted with massive retribution from every corner of the world. It's basically be a lot of instability. It'd be a major blow to um, president, the, the Chinese president's credibility and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, interesting side effect of all this has been Bitcoin. Um, I want, how many of you were expecting me to mention Bitcoin? Huh? I'd, lo- I w- I'd love to see you raise your hands if I could see you. Um, but Bitcoin kind of enter- enters into this because, as I mentioned in my email a few weeks ago, Bitcoin got up to $1,160, um, maybe was it even last week or so, um, the re- in the last week or two. And 
which was crazy because I mean it was it went up hundreds of dollars in just a month. So a huge rise in the value of Bitcoin. And uh, then it says in the squeeze to prop up the yuan. So basically, in, in the the Chinese government's attempt to prop up their currency, Bitcoin inversely plunged as much as twenty three percent to a low of eight ninety. And I think I don't have it open front of me, but I'm pretty sure it's even been down as low as eight hundred dollars. So it it jumped to eleven sixty, then plummeted over twenty five percent, almost in a matter of like a day or two. It was really rapid drop, and so. You know, as he says in the article, so much for the digital va- digital virtual currency being a quote unquote store of value, um, which is something that that title has always been um, used for gold specifically. People have wondered whether or not Bitcoin could become a digital version of that or a digital virtual currency that offers a store of value um, against fiat currencies, because since Bitcoin is not tied to a central bank and supposedly is outside of central bank control, maybe it could you know have that store of value. I still like the idea of Bitcoin. I don't think it's something that um, I'm not going to make it my, my my foremost investment by any means. But I used to always say it was a, it, at best it it was a lottery ticket. Not a bad idea to, to regularly put money in it to um, to purchase some. That was has been my approach for a long time. Um, and I do feel like, despite the big run up and the drop off of late, it still is up significantly uh, over the past year. And I do think the longer Bitcoin is around. The more traction it gains, the more it gets used in transactions. Um, I think that it does have the possibility to become a um, a significant investment from a currency perspective. And I mentioned before, Chris DeMuth has mentioned he likes to keep 10% of his cash reserves in Bitcoin, which is very significant to me because I think he's a brilliant investor. And if he's thinking that, then it's something that I it, that, that helped me shift my thinking from Bitcoin as a lottery ticket to, yeah, it's still a risky um, currency in many ways, but one that may have very significant reward potential as well. So maybe worth holding on to on some level. Again, make your own decisions there. Um, But with all that being said, the dollar is still really strong and that poses problems, Um, especially for the U.S. in terms of if we have the strongest currency, then it makes it hard for our companies to... um, we're going to international level because it's harder to sell stuff um, because our dollar is so strong and people have to buy stuff in dollars. So anyway, this let's see here. So bottom line is there's a lot of complexities going on currency-wise around the world. And part of all that is because the U.S. is still the the best looking house on a really bad, in the really bad neighborhood that the dollar keeps getting stronger. And so... Um, that's really the way things wrap up. And, and, and the lesson of the article, according to um, Mr. Forsyth, is that stable exchange rates are positive for financial and economic conditions. Currency wars are lose-lose situations. And to quote Shin Z- Sun Tzu from um, The Art of War, uh, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. So that's the big picture this week in terms of up and down Wall Street as far as big news that is, uh, I think, relevant to us as investors. And you see themes have been going on the last few weeks and months regarding the the Chinese currency and the U- and currencies as a whole. So it's going to be a really interesting thing to play out. And again, I mentioned an email I sent to my email list a week or two ago, the significance of Bitcoin rising as significantly as it has, which I just discussed, but also the fact that gold had been declining significantly since the, I guess, well, definitely since the Federal Reserve announced a new interest rate hike, um, but it's actually been, re- the precious metals have been recovering a little bit in the last week or two, but before that, they'd seen, I think gold had dropped like $200 in uh, uh, maybe the last six months, whereas Bitcoin had jumped that much in probably less than one month. And um, and so in that article, in that that email, I referenced what I just shared about Krista Moose views, but I also talked about Doug Eberhardt. He's someone who I, I respect his views on gold and silver a lot. Um, you know, obviously anyone can make mistakes, so no one is um, a perfect oracle regarding things. But one of the things I like about Doug is he owns a website or a company where he sells gold and silver. And so it's in his best interest for people to want to buy gold and silver. But he, I would say, has enough integrity to be really honest about whether or not he thinks he's bullish or bearish on gold and, and, and silver at any given time. And he had been bearish on gold and silver for um, for a while, since probably the midpoint of last year and Probably up until a few weeks ago, he was bearish, and and he did mention back in December that he expected 
the gold and silver to begin to climb again, maybe mid-January, and maybe have a strong run. But then eventually, probably later in the year, and again, there's no one knows exact timing for stuff, he still expects there to be a significant um, deflationary cycle where um, due to all the um, the, the debt, global debt levels and stuff like that, <clears throat> excuse me, eventually there will be a significant deflationary event, which would mean that the the U.S. dollar or the, the, the basically would drive down the value of gold and silver. And in his opinion, that is the really great buying opportunity. He 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 thinks the price could fall, fall below a thousand, and he thinks that in his his view, nine hundred dollars is his prime um, price for entering into gold, or he'd like that to be his average. Um, purchase price again, like he, and he'll be honest. He'll say it himself too. That doesn't mean it's going to get there. It may not ever get that low, or it could fall lower. You don't know, but that's what he would like to see happen. And he thinks that there probably be, have be one more notable um, price decline in gold and silver before he thinks the um, the significant bull market in in precious metals will resume. And he likes to use to quote Richard Russell, who is I guess a mentor of an investing mentor of his. I was going to ask him how bullish. Is he on a, a upcoming precious metals bull market? And he said, "Well, he didn't like to put price dollars on anything. You know, you, you don't know what's going to actually happen in terms of um, how how valuable gold or silver could become, and or what the environment around it will be. But he expects enough of a I don't want to use the word crisis, but maybe it will be maybe enough of a currency level financial crisis scenario." that gold and silver would rise to, to quote Richard Russell, undreamed of heights. So that's, that's all that Doug likes to say. He didn't say it, like I say, a dollar amount, but if it's going to go to quote unquote undreamed of heights, then, you know, who cares about the dollar amount? Because obviously that would mean you'd be doing well. And basically we talked, actually talked about this a lot in our interview for the DIY Investing Summit. So I will give somewhat of a shameless plug that um, Doug and I talk about all that stuff as far as his views on gold and silver, what he expects to happen, how he, he, plans on investing in gold and silver and what he plans on doing once the prices start rising significantly and why it's important to get out early and not get too greedy and all that kind of stuff. And so again, that interview will be at the DIY Investing Summit, DIYinvestingsummit.com. So be sure to check that out. So that's the world in investing right now. Thanks so much for spending your time with us here at Investing in the Family Radio. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. And thanks for joining the family. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities. 